Thank you. Thanks, Britt, for your very kind introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. So I'm going to talk about a very old problem of attention. And unfortunately, for time's sake, I actually took some historical slides out, but I'll be happy to show you at the end um, some handhold quotes on the topic. But the issue that I want to bring up is that each time that we open our eyes, we're actually confronted with an overwhelming amount of information and despite this fact, we have the clear impression of understanding what we see. This requires selecting relevant information out of the relevant noise. And one, thing that I, one way that I think about attention is that it often turns looking into seeing. Um, I'm going to ask you to look at this slide. Just look at it, please, and see where you notice changes that are happening on the slide. There's several of them happening. They're happening gradually. And they're, they're happening right in front of you. So did you notice changes? Yes? OK. Uh, in class, people go like this. And I said, I noticed two. They're about 34, and I stopped counting. <laughs> but I want you to look that this is the original image, and this is the final image. So wherever you look, I'm going to flip back and forth. There's very, very pronounced changes that happen right in front of you. Here are the slides side to side. You see that people disappear from some places, appeared in others. Letters appeared from some places, disappeared from some, appeared in others. The facade changed, the material, the colors. Everything happened right in front of you. So one of the questions is, how come when the input, the retinal input is constant, we fail to perceive a lot of things that are happening, and yet we walk around feeling that we really are in command of our environment? This issue of visual attention has actually um, captured a lot of attention, no pun intended, at the, beginning of the 19, at the end of the 19th century, people like Helmholtz and Bunt talk about attention, of course, James. And then there was, as I want you to see here, there was a big gap uh, regarding attention for a number of reasons that I would be happy to discuss. But what I want you to see here is I'm plotting the number of articles as a function of year. And these are articles that in PubMed have the world visual attention in the title or in the keywords or the abstract. So it's critical. And what I want you to notice is that um, more than half of them have been published in the last 10 years. And that dashed line of 1990 actually indicates how few articles there were before, um, and in particular, how many there were that re refer to basic perception. So for a while, when we talk about attention, we thought about really high cognitive processes. And one, the thing that I'm interested about is how attention affects visual perception, and in particular, basic aspects of information, because that can tell us how much attention affects every aspect of our daily life. So I'm going to talk about, um, or I'm going to divide the talk in three parts today. First, I'm going to describe covert attention. Then I'm going to talk about its effects on contrast sensitivity. And last, I'm going to talk about its effects on spatial resolution. So the concept of limited resources has been present in cognitive psychology since the 60s. We know that we're not aware of everything. I'm not going to talk about consciousness. But of course, attention relates to consciousness. And I'll be happy to um, speculate at the end if you wish. Um, but I'm going to concentrate on attention. And we know, in, again, in cognitive psychology, there's several demonstrations that show that there's limited resources. But it's not until more recently, actually, that um, there's been a biophysical explanation for those limited resources. So we know that there's a high energy cost of neural activity that is involved in cortical computation. And that limits our ability to process visual information. Sorry, it's really hard to see like, from here, so I'm coming here. So we know that there's a constant overall energy consumption that is available to the brain, and that the neuronal metabolic cost depends on the spike rate, and the cost of a single spike is high. So the average discharge rate of active neurons determines how many neurons can be active concurrently. 
And Peter Lenny, some years ago, in an article called The Cost of Cortical Computation, calculated that only about 1% of neurons can be active concurrently above base level. And then it follows that the brain needs some machinery to allocate energy according to task demand. And he proposes that one such mechanism is attention. It's not the only one, but it's an important mechanism. Adaptation is another one, for example. So we can think of attention as a key mechanism that allows us to manage energy, which is quite limited. Um, when we talk about visual attention, we talk about selective information processing. So there's many kinds, many different kinds of attention. Today I'm going to talk about covert attention, which is the ability that we have to deploy attention to a particular region in space, regardless of when we're looking at. So I could be looking at Jim, but I can actually deploy my attention towards Brit. And we can do this, monkeys can do this, chicken can do this, every animal that has been tested can do this. Now, there's many different kinds of covert attention. The one I'm going to talk about is spatial, and probably is the one, not probably, certainly is the one that we know more about. And in particular, I'm going to talk about two types of spatial attention, exogenous and endogenous, which I will explain in a moment. But I just want to make clear that there's other kinds of attention. For example, there's feature-based attention, which means that rather than attending to a specific location in space, I can attend to a particular color. So for example, if I notice that Conrad is using a purple shirt and I just call his attention, rather than searching space, I can search for that particular feature. And there's plenty of evidence, again, from animal work, in particular from monkeys and from humans, that we're capable of processing selectively those features across the space, across visual field. There's also object-based attention. And there's a growing interest in understanding temporal aspects of attention. That is, how do I deploy attention to particular points in time? Um, another thing that is very important and I won't talk about, but I just want to bring it up because a lot of, inform a lot of research is happening in many labs in that direction, including my own, is dealing with interactions of what we call covert attention and overt attention. That means eye movements. So what happens at the target location when I'm preparing an eye movement? And there's plenty of, plenty of evidence now that shows that we selectively process information at that target location before we move our eyes. And that the way in which information is affected is not exactly the same as when we don't plan an eye movement. So today, as I said, I'm going to concentrate on, covert, on spatial aspects of covert attention and just to make sure that we are all on the same page, I'll ask you to look at the screen and imagine that you are here at the start of the New York Marathon and there are hundreds of runners on the bridge. So it would seem that we're capable of processing all information simultaneously, but our ability to process details in the periphery, as you know, is rather limited. This is, of course, a cartoon, but your high resolution fovea is placed at the middle, say that you're trying to recognize that man that is waving, and resolution decreases pronouncedly towards the periphery. So maybe you want to watch a friend for whom you know you will be coming on the right-hand side of the bridge, but you're also trying to figure out whether that man is waving at you. Now, you have two regions of space that you want to monitor, the man that is ahead at your phobia, but also you want to monitor for another location. So what you can do is deploy your endogenous covert attention. And that is voluntary. So you decide that you want to attend to a region, a particular region in space, and that's voluntary. But there's another kind of attention when things happen in the environment that automatically elicit shifts of spatial attention to, that, to another location. So let's imagine here that someone is going to take a picture, and over here on the left, there was a flash, so our spatial, exogenous spatial attention was located or was um, deployed transiently to that location. And that's exogenous, because you didn't plan to do that. Rather, there was a change in the environment that elicited that change. These two systems of attention, or two types of attention, have been characterized very well behaviorally and 
we know much more about the endogenous component neurophysiologically. So the first system is endogenous or voluntary. Uh, you can find it in the literature also as goal-driven. And it contrasts with the second one, which is exogenous, involuntary, or automatic. So we know that the endogenous system, the voluntary one, is flexible. That is, the benefits in performance scale with Q validity. So, and I'll give some examples of how we manipulate that. But it's a flexible system, and I will be illustrating how that's the case. In contrast, the exogenous system is automatic. It's transient. Um, it peaks at 100 milliseconds, so it's much faster than saccadic eye movements are, and it dies shortly thereafter. Whereas the endogenous system is sustained, it takes about 300 milliseconds to be deployed, and it can be maintained at the desired location for a long time. Now, until a few years ago, we thought that endogenous attention had more to do with cortical systems and exogenous with subcortical, but actually, we know different now. We know that both of them are mediated by cortical and subcortical structures. And today, I'm going to concentrate on talking about some perceptual consequences of these systems. I'm going to give you some uh, evidence from neuroimaging studies too, and I'm going to talk about the normalization model of attention. With regard to perception, I want to point out that in most cases, endogenous and exogenous attention give you similar um, perceptual consequences, but not in all cases, and today I'm going to talk about some cases in which the consequences differ to try to illustrate the flexibility versus the automaticity of these systems. So we know that both systems improve visual discriminability. Um, they improve contrast sensitivity and spatial resolution, which are the uh, dimensions that I will concentrate on today, but they affect performance mediated by motion, visual search, etc. We also know that they modulate subjective appearance. This is um, the paper actually that Britt was um, alluding to. I'm not going to talk about that, but I'll be happy to talk about that at the end if you have any questions about it. Um, and I'm going to make a distinction between perceptual performance and appearance or subjective appearance. And we also know that both endogenous and exogenous attention speed up information accrual. Um, there's been many behavioral reviews and reviews linking behavior with our neurophysiological knowledge and um, neuroimaging knowledge. And there's many um, excellent neurophysiological reviews of visual attention too. Now one thing that I want just to specify um, is that attention unfortunately has not always been well defined. And that's one of the reasons why it was out of study for some years because it seemed that there was a lot of circularity we knew that attention was present in some uh, phenomena because it affected performance. How do we know that? Because attention was there. So there was a lot of circular behavior. So I think uh, we have advanced in the field. And one of the things that is very important, like in any science enterprise, is, of course, to define clearly and to operationalize what we mean by attention. For covert attention, it's very important to keep both the task and the stimuli constant across conditions and at the same time, manipulate attention. So I want to um, stress that it's important to manipulate it rather than to infer it. And of course, if we're dealing with covert attention, we want to monitor eye movement to make sure that people are not breaking fixation and also because there's also some microscopic eye movements like microsaccas that could be indicative of covert attention. The other thing that is very important is that in the way in which we manipulate attention in the studies that I'm going to talk about today is through queuing studies, they should convey only information that is orthogonal to the task. Um, some of the first studies of covert attention actually had some very strong confounds because people could have just um, followed the probability of the queue, close the eyes, and give the response that uh, was observed and attributed to attention. So these are like one on one things that one we would like to have if we're talking about covert attention. So with regard to the effects of contrast sensitivity, um, I assume that all of you have looked at this in an intro psych book or neuroscience book, perception book. This is a contrast sensitivity function. And what we have here is we have contrast um, on the y-axis as a function of spatial frequency. 
So towards the bottom of the slide, actually, I don't, is it possible to turn the light closest to me all? Thanks. Towards the bottom of the slide, you can see sinusoidal fluctuations of light and darkness very clearly. But as you move upward, there's a moment in which you can no longer see these fluctuations. And depending on your age, the quality of your eyes, how far you're seated, thank you so much. Now you can see better all of a sudden. <laughs> uh, but there's still a moment in which you no longer see these fluctuations. If you are wearing glasses, just take them off and put them back, and you can see a very, very clear difference, right? Now, this has been considered the window of visibility. That is, everything that is under that curve, which of course changes from person to person, depending on a number of variables, is part of our window of visibility. And what is outside of that curve is outside the window of visibility. So many years ago, when people were only thinking that attention had to do with very high cognitive processes, we actually wonder if it was possible for attention to expand the contrast sensitivity function, i.e. the window of visibility. And what we found, these are actually data, is that if people are attending to a particular location, and I'll explain in a moment how we manipulate that with a peripheral cue, for each cycle per degree, for low cycles per degree and high cycles per degree, we need less contrast in order to attain the same performance level if we're attending that if we're not attending focally with a neutral cue. And this you can see clearly. So this is by now a very old study, but it was a study that showed that actually attention could affect very early visual processes. Um, till throughout the 1990s, the whole debate was what was pre-attentive and what is post-attentive. And I think uh, these and many other studies really have shown that maybe that's not a very useful way to dichotomize the world because when we look at any basic dimension, we actually find very pronounced effects of attention. So let me give you an idea of how we study this. Imagine that you are in front of a computer and where's the mouse here? So uh, you're um, fixating and then a cue is flashed either in the central or peripherally very briefly and after a very short interval, a display appears. And this display, by the way, is incredibly simple and boring. These are just gabors that are the simpler possible stimulus for the system. There's a good reason why we study gabors, because we understand the physiology well and we can communicate with, monkey, with uh, animal studies too. And we understand, um, we know how to model them well. So, we have these very simple displays, and after a brief interval, we're going to present a response cue to the observer and tell her to tell us what is the orientation of the stimulus that was at that location. So what I want to make clear is that there's conditions in which the peripheral cue appeared at the same location as the response cue. So in that case, we're going to say that that's a valid cue, but there's cases in which the peripheral cue actually points to the other location, and that is an invalid cue. And people know in advance for this particular type of exogenous attention that the cue is not informative. That is, that you're equally likely to be asked about the target that was cued or not. And what we find is that regardless of being non-informative, there's a benefit at performance at the valid cue locations that is accompanied by a cost that is if I am attending to this particular location, the rest of the world could remain the same or actually there could be a trade-off. And what we found invariably, even in this very, very simple displays, in that there's a pronounced trade-off, okay? Now, I want to point out that this, even though people know that this is not beneficial for them because the queue is not informative. So, we have now a good understanding that this is automatic system, that there's these trade-offs, and we wanted to know what is the neural correlate of this exogenous attention effect. So we conducted an fMRI study. Um, many of you may be familiar with this, but we can do some very simple retinotopic mapping, as you see on the upper left, where we flash information at different parts of the display, and we can map exactly in early visual cortex where the information is presented. <laughs> Retinotopic simply means that two things that are neighboring in the outside environment are also represented as neighbors in our brain. 
So for each observer, we define the borders among the early visual areas by these retinotopic methods. And then we define a region of interest for the stimulus in each visual area. So we're going to be concentrating in occipital, in um, striped and extra striped areas. And this is just a cartoon of the slide placement so that we can have a good resolution of these areas. So one of the things that we do is to take advantage of the fact that we know that the bold response or the blood oxygenated level dependent response increases with contrast. So as you can see towards the left here, we have a low contrast stimulus. And here we have a high contrast stimulus. And you see that the stimulus evoked activity in the brain is going to increase. So now that we know that attention enhances contrast sensitivity from the behavioral studies, we wanted to see whether we could find a similar effect to the fact that is produced by physical changes in the stimulus. So what we did was to first, um, this is an inflated brain. So just to guide you, um, here would be the fovea representation. We have some cues like the one that I had showed you before above the horizontal meridian, so that now they're going to be represented in the ventral pathway. And the stimuli are below the horizontal meridian, so that they are represented in the dorsal pathway. And um, of course, these colors are just for demonstration here. I want you to see that even in V1, that doesn't have a different representation. We have a clear representation for the cue and the stimulus that is not overlapping. And um, in case there's some subthreshold activation, we're going to do some behavioral manipulations to make sure that we can tell apart whether if we see enhanced activity at the attended area, it's really due to attention rather than just to um, cue contamination or the fact that this cue would have produced some signal too. So what we do is a very similar procedure to the one I just told you before, where there's going to be a pre-queue, there's going to be two gabors, and we're going to have a response queue. But interestingly here, what we're going to do is a post-queue trial, which is on the right. So we're simply going to invert the order of the queue and the stimuli. They're going to be reversed. And this is because of the sluggishness of the hemodynamic response compared to the Q-target interstimulus interval is very slow. So it allows us to um, see that a sensory region that responds to both the Q and the target could not differentiate between the two. Is that clear? So we're taking advantage of one of the worst things that we have in fMRI, which is the sluggishness of the response. And here we're taking advantage of it and we're saying, if it is just that we're doing some Q-target summation, then the activation that was in this pre-queue and post-queue should be the same. But if in reality, the observed difference has to do with attention, then we expect some differences for the pre-queue, but not for the post-queue. And the first thing we do inside the magnet, of course, is to do, as we are imaging, we do exactly the same orientation discrimination task that outside of the magnet. So this is just to show a replication of many previous studies in the lab, which is that with valid pre queues your accuracy is better than with invalid pre queues or with post queues And at the same time, we always look at reaction time as a secondary measurement just to make sure that there's not speed accuracy trade-offs. So we make sure that the response that was higher in terms of discriminability was not slower or you couldn't conclude anything. Indeed, we find that it's not only that accuracy is higher, but reaction time is faster. So we have the signature of uh, attention manipulation. And then we look in, um, at the blood oxygenated level dependent response or both in each of the regions of interest in which we had localized our stimulus. And what we find is that as expected, the responses picked at the third time point, which is between four and six seconds. And we found here that activi activity was marginally higher for the valid pre queue condition in V1, but significantly higher in V2, V3, V3A, and V4, which is not shown. So I'm comparing the red function to all the other functions, including to the presence just of the distractors, which is in gray. And to summarize these findings, we can calculate an attentional modulation index, 
by obtaining the ratio of the difference of the peak value for the valid pre-Q and baseline over their sum. So we're going to take the difference, and so a value of zero would mean no effect of attention, and the higher the value is, the higher the effect of attention. And as you can see here, the attention modulation index increased gradually from V1 to extrastriate visual areas. Now for endogenous attention, that has been interpreted as due to the frontal or frontoparietal sources of the effect. However, here I want to remind you that we're working with exogenous attention, so we could expect the same just due to a feed-forward mechanism where attention modulation may accumulate across sequential levels of processing. Um, so we're agnostic to the source of this in this particular um, study. But this was the first demonstration, actually, that exogenous attention um, has a concurrent effect in performance and retinotopically specific stimulus evoked activity. Now the question is, what's the mechanism that is mediating this increased contrast sensitivity? And we know from many neurophysiological studies um, that there's been a long controversial debate about how attention affects neural responses to different contrasts. So here we have a normalized response as a function of log contrast. And on the left, we have what is referred to a contrast gain. So if you, in monkey studies, if you have an ignored stimulus or not attended stimulus, the psychometric function would be, or the neurometric function would be in blue. And many studies have shown that when the monkey attends to a particular location, actually this function shifts towards the left, as if there's a multiplicative um, response, if, if there's a multi, uh, as if attention is increases the neural response by multiplying the stimulus contrast by a constant gain factor. And the effect is largest at intermediate levels because the contrast response often saturates. Now, there's many other studies that have shown a response gain. Sorry. Many other studies have shown a response gain here. And what you can see here is that the attention effect increases as a function of stimulus contrast. And that is because uh, it's been proposed that this response gain is characterized as an upward shift of the constant response function, and it's as if attention increases neural responses by multiplicatively, um, by, by multiplying the response. So the effect is going to be largest at higher stimulus contrast. And other studies, like this one, have shown actually that you can find some neurons that have contrast gain, some neurons that have response gain, and some that show what is known as activity gain, that is a change throughout the stimulus function. Now, parallel to that, in psychophysics, we know that we can plot D prime, for those of you that are familiar, familiar with signal detection theory, D prime is a measure of sensitivity. And it's proportional to the signal-to-noise ratio of the underlying neural responses. So if you have additive, independent, and identically distributed noise, a max and a maximum likelihood decision rule, any change in the, in the contrast response function that I just showed you in um, neuronal contrast response function would be reflected as a parallel change in performance accuracy. And it turns out to be that in psychophysics also there's been some reports of contrast gain, in particular with endogenous or voluntary attention. There have been reports of response gain, in particular with exogenous attention. And there's been some studies that have reported a mixture of contrast gain and response gain. So some time ago, uh, my uh, friends and colleagues, uh, John Reynolds and David Heger, postulated the, normaliza the normalization model of attention, and it was proposed to address why some studies yield contrast gain and some other studies yield response gain. Now, the idea of normalization stems from the normalization model of visual responses, which was introduced in the 90s, and normalization is considered to be a canonical computation which has been co-opted for different processes throughout the brain. So 
normalization, um, in normalization, you have responses of neurons that are divided by a common factor that includes the sum activity of a pool neurons. And um, normalization model of attention is going to simulate the neuronal and behavioral responses and identify two key parameters that underlie whether a contrast gain or a response gain should result. And those parameters are the size of the stimulus and the size of the attention field. And what is critical of this particular normalization model of attention, because there's others that have been proposed, is that attention multiplicatively enhances stimulus evoked responses before normalization. So let me give you just an idea of this model. This model consists of three main components, the stimulus drive, the attention gain factors, and the normalization factors, which together result in the population responses. So the four squares that we have here, the peak neural images, and each point is going to correspond to the response of a neuron, which can be specified with a certain receptor field center here across position and orientation preference. And the stimulus drive is going to lead to an excitatory stimulus for a population of neurons that index by the presence of that particular position or orientation. So the grade level here indicates the stimulus drive for each neuron, which is largest, largest for the neurons whose preferred positions and orientations match the stimulus. Now, this stimulus drive is going to be modulated by the attention field, which is stimulated by an array of attentional gain factors, which depend of the range of attended locations. Here, the attention would be on the right side of the display and features. And for spatial attention, we see that all the gain factors would be at a particular location, regardless of the particular orientation. For feature-based attention, that would be the opposite. The gain factors would be at a given orientation level, regardless of space. And the attention gain factors are going to be multiplied point by point with the stimulus drive and the normalization factors are going to be computed from the results of this multiplication by pulling over space and orientation through convolution with a suppressive field. So the output firing rates of the population are going to be computing by dividing the stimulus drive by the normalization factors. And these results in population response that is amplified at the site where attention was deployed. So let me give you a very uh, fast intuition. The model equation consists of the stimulus drive divided by a suppressive drive plus a constant. So if the attention field is large, which here I indicate with these dead, uh, red dotted lines, then the attentional gain factors multiply the stimulus drive and the normalization factors by the same amount. So it turns up everything in the model equation and this has the same effect as just turning off the contrast, which results in a contrast gain, as you can see on the left. If the attention field is small and the stimulus is larger, relatively speaking, as in this uh, cartoon here, then the attention gain factors multiply the entire summation field in the numerator of the equation, but only the center of the suppressive field in the denominator. So it's as if attention is carving out the region in the surround and decreases the suppression of the denominator, and this results in a response gain. So in simulations that uh, Reynolds and Higer did, the model exhibited contrast gain when the attention field size was relatively larger than the stimulus size and response gain in the opposite conditions. Uh, but there's no single unit study that had tested these predictions. So what we did was to uh, conduct psychophysical and fMRI studies to see whether these predictions of the model were correct. So to do that, we follow a protocol that is very similar to the one that I had already shown you. Um, so for exogenous attention, we're going to have an informative cues. So in a third of the trials, the cue is going to be valid. That is, its location is going to match the response cue. 
For a third of the trials, it's going to be invalid. There's going to be a mismatch between the queue location and the response queue. And in a third of the trials, we're going to have a neutral queue, which indicates that the target is equally likely to be at one or the other location. For endogenous attention, we have informative queues. Endogenous attention is the voluntary system that I talked about before. So in this case, the valid queues are going to be a central queue that points towards the uh, location where the target is most likely to appear with 75% probability. The invalid queues are going to point to the opposite location. And again, neutral queues are going to point to both locations, indicating that the, stimul that the target is equally likely to appear at one or the other. And I just want you to notice here that the, the, the times are different because as I explained before, exogenous attention is much faster than endogenous attention. So the protocol optimizes the deployment in both so that we can compare them. And this is just a cartoon of a large stimulus and a small attention field. So if you're fixating in the center and you have a large stimulus and a cue indicates where the stimulus is going to come, there's very little uncertainty regarding where the target is going to be. So in this case, we have a large stimulus and relatively small attention field size. In contrast, we have small stimulus in a large attention field, which are predictors of contrast gain. So the observer does not see these dotted lines. It's just to indicate to you that this small stimulus could appear at any of these five locations. And the queue is going to co-vary with them. So if you are an observer and you're fixating in the center and you don't know where exactly this is going to appear, you're going to have a larger attention field. And that is predictive according to the model of contrast gain. And here are the results. So what we found is that when you have a large stimulus and small attention field, just as the model predicted, regardless of whether we're working with exogenous or endogenous attention, we have a response gain. So we have an effect, a benefit in red compared to the neutral in black, and a cost in blue compared, this is in valid queue, compared to the neutral location. So we have a pronounced effect at the maximum D prime or at the asymptotic level, but no effect in what is called C50, which is the point in which, the intermediate point between the lower and the higher asymptote. And again, this is the case for exogenous and endogenous attention. In contrast, when we have a small stimulus embedded in a large attention field, now we see a clear signature of contrast gain where we see changes at the C50, but we see no changes at the asymptotic level. So this is consistent with the predictions of the model, but of course one could say, well, stimulus size is really easy to manipulate, but isn't there a little bit of circular behavior because you're saying that there's an attention, a large attention field, but we really don't have a proof for that. And of course, that's the concern we had. So we did an fMRI study in which we have a very similar protocol to the one I told you about, and we measure the attention field. So what we did here was have a fixation, a pre queue and the stimuli could appear Observers are doing the same to alternative for choice orientation discrimination task. But what we wanted to do here was to de-emphasize the stimulus evoked responses. So we had a very brief stimulus duration, a small stimulus, and low contrast. Because we wanted to put the cortical circuit in a regime in which cortical activity is dominated by feedback synaptic inputs. So we compared high spatial uncertainty, as you can see on the left. So again, a small stimulus that is embedded in one of these five possible locations. The dotted lines are not present to the observer. With a stimulus that is identical, the same size, but now we have no spatial uncertainty. So we actually show these placeholders so that um, people know exactly where the stimulus is going to appear. And what we're going to do is compare only the 
evoked, stimulus evoked response when the stimulus was in this third location, so that everything is identical except for the uncertainty. That is, except for the size of the attention field. And what we find is that uh, when we plot the attention field size with uncertainty, as a function of the attention field size with no uncertainty, we see in this scatter plot that for nine out of 10 hemispheres, the field size was larger when there was uncertainty than when there was not. So uh, each symbol here corresponds to one observer and to one hemisphere, actually, of one observer. So what we conclude here is that exogenous and endogenous attention enhance performance via contrast gain or response gain depending on the relative size of the attention field and the stimulus. We know that spatial uncertainty manipulation was effective because the attention field is larger with than without uncertainty as revealed by the bold response. And one thing that I want to stress of this model is that attention multiplies the stimulus evoked activity before normalization. In that way, its effects can differ at the numerator and the denominator, affecting the excitation and uh, altering the balance between excitation and suppression or excitation and inhibition. There's other models in which the effect on excitation is, uh, and suppression is the same, and when that's the case, one would always get contrast gain responses. There's other models in which attention affects the strength of normalization, and when that is the case, according to all the simulations we did, that would always yield response gain. So this is a uh, framework that we have used in the lab, and this is in collaboration with my colleague David Heger, and we have tested this model for feature-based attention and for appearance, and um, so far it's helping um, explain many of the behavioral results that we have. So just to summarize this part of contrast sensitivity, I want to remind you we have shown that attention improves performance in what is called first-order contrast or second-order contrast, which um, for lack of time I couldn't talk about here. As Britt mentioned, we also have found that attention alters appearance. So just to give you a very short inclination, the protocols are similar but are not the same, and I would be happy to talk about them. But if you were fixating at this fixation point and you were attending to the stimulus that is on the left, your system would perceive it as being of the same contrast as the stimulus that is on the right. We have found that the behavior improvement correlates with fMRI signal in striate and extra striate cortical areas. And we have shown that there's a change in performance and appearance that, can, that is compatible with the predictions of the normalization model of attention of Reynolds and Higer. So this gives us an overall good understanding on how attention is altering contrast sensitivity. There's another very important dimension of basic visual processing, which is spatial resolution. And that's what I want to talk about in the remaining of the talk. So just to remind you, um, spatial resolution is the ability to discriminate two nearby points in space. And it's going to depend on receptor size and the number and spacing of receptors. So we know that spatial resolution decreases with eccentricity, as I show in the cartoon of the man running in the marathon. And another important thing to keep in mind is that the average filter size is going to be inversely correlated with the preferred spatial frequency. So on the bottom, you see the spatial frequencies that I illustrated with the contrast sensitivity function. And we know that in the phobia, we have more receptors that are um, responsible of manipulating high spatial frequencies. And in periphery, we have a dominance of low spatial frequencies. And this is going to become important when we're trying to understand the mechanisms by which attention alters resolution. Uh, but before I tell you about that, I just want to remind you that the receptor field size, which you see here on the left, and what is called the population receptive field size, which is calculated in our imaging studies, increases with eccentricity and increases across the visual areas. And as you can see here 
oh, I don't know why I have this. As you can see here, we have um, nice parallelism between the receptor field size from macaques and the population receptor field size from humans that have been measured with neuroimaging. Now, there's a lot of evidence that attention affects spatial resolution. We know that it benefits performance, for example, in visual search tasks, in acuity tasks, and crowding. We also know that attention changes the appearance of spatial stimulus attributes, um, for example, gap size. I'm not going to talk about that, the appearance studies today. And from physiology, we know that there's changes in receptive field size that uh, structure and position. So some years ago with a former postdoc in the lab, Katarina Anton Erschleben, we wrote this review in which we link the psychophysical and the neurophysiological evidence relating to the effects of attention on spatial resolution. So I'm going to show you some cartoons from that review. Oops, wow, it looks awful. It looks good in the screen. Uh, we're going to have to imagine a little bit. I'll try to point to where you should be seen. So just to tell you, I'm going to use some cartoons and then I'm going to show you the neurophysiological or the psychophysical data. So this is to show that attention alters the receptor field profiles. So here you have the response of a preferred stimulus. So this is the response and this time. And here you have the response of a preferred stimulus that is presented alone in purple. Here in this cartoon, you see purple in the intermediate level. And we have the response, it's hard to see even here now. We have the response of the non-preferred stimulus that is of another orientation, which is much lower, that you can see here in the bottom. And what I would like you to see is that in black, you see the response when the same receptor field size has a preferred and non-preferred stimulus. And what it has been shown physiologically several times is that if the monkey attends, or puts attention on the preferred stimulus, then this response increases. As you can see here in purple, the preferred stimulus alone is fainter here. And I apologize, I don't know why, but I can see it perfectly on my screen. This is when attention is on the preferred stimulus, and when attention is on the non-preferred stimulus, actually the response decreases. So based on these studies, people predict, uh, or people um, propose that attention is shifting, shifting the receptor field size and narrowing the receptor field size around the attended stimulus. And again, this cartoon is hard to see here, but here what we have is uh, when, is it possible to see in the bottom? Because if it's not at all, I'll just jump to the data here, which you can see better. So these are data from Stefan Troyes lab, who shows that the receptor fields can shrink or expand with attention. So what you have here is um, the, the colors represent the spike in activity. And here you have a receptive field map of a representative cell. When the task was a fixation point, which is white uh, square here, and when the position of the receptor field was attended, where is here. And what you can see is that receptor field area, which is outlined on white, is clearly reduced when attention is inside of the receptor field. This is while monkey is still fixating, but now is attending to this particular location. In contrast, now we can compare the response, the RF size when the monkey is fixating here and when it is attending besides the classical receptor field. And now what you can see is that there's an expansion of the receptor field size. So these studies show that as a function of where the monkey is attending, the receptor field size is actually going to, to shrink or to expand. So we had a series of psychophysical studies in the lab. And when Katarina, who is um, an author in these studies to join the lab, we decided to see how we could 
if and how we could explain the psychophysical findings based on these neurophysiological findings. So here, I, again, I go back to the cartoons. Um, is it possible to see them or not? Because, yes. yes, okay, thanks. So here I have reaction time on error, ta or error rate plotted as a function of set size. This is a typical visual search size that many of you have been familiar, may be familiar with. Um, so observers are looking for a vertical purple targets among vertical, uh, among tilted purple targets, and it's supposed to be blue, but they just disappear. And what you can see is that as the set size or as target eccentricity increases, performance actually is slower. And what has been found is that with attention, you get rid of this set size effect. It is as if attention allows you to isolate better the target. So here we see a cartoon that has in this peach color um, the possible integration field size. So when you're not attending, you are integrating information of the target and distractors, but when you're attending and it's almost impossible to see here now, um, you see that the receptor field size or the integration field would only be in the target. In that way, we could explain that now the distractors have a very little effect. And this is what you see in data. So here we plot reaction time on the top and percent error on the bottom as a function of eccentricity. And what we show is if you have small stimuli, the farther the target appears or the more peripheral the target appears, the reaction time and the error rate increase. But if you magnify the display, so if we use the cortical magnification factor, which means that we enlarge stimuli that are in the periphery so that the real state in the cortex is the same, so to speak, now we get rid of this effect. And this is important because that has been attributed to attention by former studies without really manipulated attention. And what we show is that there's a lot of stimulus factors that could explain these findings. But later we decided to see, because we had a suspicion that attention um, could increase spatial resolution, so we said, what would happen if we have exactly the same stimulus, but now in some cases, we manipulate attention to the target location, and in some, we don't. And what you see is that when we don't manipulate attention, you have this increasing function with set size for reaction time and for errors, but when you manipulate attention, you pretty much get rid of that set size effect. The functions are flattened. So what I want you to notice here is the parallelism of what happens when you enlarge the stimuli to get rid of resolution differences and when you attend. And in both cases, we get a very similar effect. So this led us to believe that uh, indeed spatial attention may be increasing spatial resolution. So we use the stimulus that is used to um, study acuity which is this Landolt square where people have to say whether a gap appears on the left or the right of the display. And again, here we plot performance as a function of target eccentricity. We see that performance drops with eccentricity. But when we manipulate attention to the target location, we see that the detrimental effect of target eccentricity actually is much diminished. And these are psychophysical data from my lab, which then were replicated in monkeys in Thiel's lab. And we find that at all eccentricities, attention reduces the acuity threshold and more so at farther eccentricities. And we show that this is the case both with exogenous or involuntary attention and endogenous or voluntary attention. In both cases, when you improve your resolution at the attended location, you decrease your resolution at the unattended location. So again, we found these trade-offs in processing. Now the question is, is it always beneficial for the system to heighten resolution? And if you think about it, most of the time it's beneficial but it's not always optimal. For example, if you're driving in a foggy environment, or when my airplane was trying to take off last night, for example, um, or if you want to see Marilyn Monroe instead of Albert Einstein, then 
high resolution is not beneficial. Um, I hope you can see both Marilyn and Einstein. You can take your glasses, you can squint, you can see more one than the other. And on the left, you can see a puntillist painting by Seurat. And again, depending of where you're sitting, and um, I should have checked the projector before, but this looks much more beautiful on my screen. Maybe, Jim, you want to do that to check the projector? So I hope that you can see that there's a painting here. From where I am, it looks terrible. But it's this puntillist painting by Seurat, which makes, case that, makes clear the case that highest resolution is not always optimal. So we have found that attention increases resolution. And we wanted to test this hypothesis. And we searched for a task in which enhanced resolution would not be beneficial for the task. So we found this texture segmentation. Literally, we were walking around Arvo, for those of you that have gone to Arvo or VSS. It was Arvo, I think. And we found this task. This is a texture segmentation. If you're fixating here, and your task is to say if there's a texture present that is some of these elements are, in the, are oriented orthogonally to the background, what, we, what has been found by many is that performance is not optimal as a dephobia as it is the case for most static tasks. But rather, performance is optimal at paraphobial locations, and then decreases as you move to further eccentricities. So here what we see is that there's a performance peak, and there's a central performance drop. And this is the fact that the, the interesting point in which we wanted to focus our research. So what happens here is that this texture segmentation depends then on the visual system's effective resolution. And I remind you again that for central and paraphobia locations, we have a dominance of high spatial frequency receptors. And at the eccentricity, far eccentricity, we have a dominance of low receptors. I'm going to skip the cartoon because they're not easy to see. And I'm just going to show you the data. And here we have. Um, in blue is the performance for a neutral condition for a small texture scale and a large texture scale. That simply means that we set the observers at a distance, we move them twice as close to the display so that now the display is twice as large. And what we can see when we compare the blue curves on the left and on the right is that on the left, peak performance is at four degrees of eccentricity, and on the right at eight degrees of eccentricity, showing that there's a very clear geometrical relation. The important part is what happens with attention, with exogenous attention. And here we show that performance improves at periphery, but is hampered at foveal locations. And what is important to see is in this highlighted blue region is that as a function of the scale of the texture, attention can improve performance or impair performance. So this shows us that attention is, exogenous attention is increasing spatial resolution as a default, even if it's detrimental for the task at hand. Um, I think for time I'm going to just keep that demonstration. I just want to tell you that um, we selectively adapted the system. So uh, there's these patterns which you can ask people to adapt for some time. And then what you show is that the response of the neurons that respond to that particular frequency decrease. And we use that um, to try to see what was explaining this impairment of attention. And what we found is that when we adapt people to a gray field, we replicate the findings that I just showed you. When we adapt them to low spatial frequency, we also get an impairment. But we adapt people to high spatial frequency, now we get rid of what is called the central performance drop, and also we get rid of the central attentional impairment. So this suggests that it's actually the high spatial frequencies that are mediating the effect of exogenous attention. And can I have three more minutes to, for the last study? So now this is surprising again, because 
exogenous is, uh, attention is making you worse at some look, at some uh, in some circumstances, if you wish. And we think that this is a heuristic of the system. It's most of the time is very is better for the system not only to have enhanced contrast sensitivity but also enhanced spatial resolution. But then we wonder, is it possible to have uh, endogenous attention actually affecting resolution in a flexible way? So here, um, again, I just, um, this is uh, on the right. Well, on the left, you see the surah that looks a little bit better now. And I just want to show you that depending on where you're sitting, there's uh, going to be uh, one of these squares is going to be better for you to see the face. And on the right, there's a rendition of Salvador Dali of a study in which, um, what do you see here on the right? Gala? Because you're close. What do you see on the back, on the right? Lincoln, yeah. So Dali actually cheated, and he gave us a little uh, face of Lincoln here and Gala. So if you don't see Lincoln, just squint or take your glasses off. And to see Gala with this projector is going to be hard, but it's here. It's going to be hard if you're not close. So the idea is that there's these spatial frequencies that are present in all the stimuli. And the question is whether attention can selectively tune them so that we see something or other. So we're going to go back to the texture segmentation that I introduced. We do the endogenous attention study. And I want you to notice here that for the same, it's exactly the same study as with exogenous attention, but here, rather than having an impairment at the central locations, we have a benefit throughout. So this study shows that endogenous attention actually helps you. And if I summarize what I've told you so far, we know that with exogenous attention, we have an impairment at the central locations. We improve peripheral locations, and I explained with the adaptation study that we know that attention increases the sensitivity of the small filters, which are responsible for high spatial frequencies. For endogenous attention, we found improvement throughout eccentricity. And then the question is whether attention increases or decreases resolution, or how this comes about. And this is the last study that I'll tell you about. This is a recent uh, paper in which, in the study, we adapted observers at the beginning of the trial. Then we pre queue the quadrant where the target was going to be if it was present and how far in the radial direction it would be. We always titrate um, the display so that performance of all observers is the same. So some observers um, need less noise than others in order to detect this texture. And at the end, there's going to be a response queue that tells observers if the target was present where it was present, so that there's no location uncertainty at the moment of the response. People adapted to these three um, adapters. There's a vertical constant modulator, which is very hard to see here. So this is the carrier noise only. So you're just adapting to this to have a baseline. You adapt to a low spatial frequency modulator, or we adapt to a high spatial frequency modulator. And the first thing that I want to show you are the predictions of adaptation. So the neutral condition or the baseline is in blue. And what we found, or what we predicted, is that if we adapted the low spatial frequencies, now the high spatial frequencies should dominate, and the central performance drop should be more pronounced and the peak of eccentricity should be more peripheral. In contrast, if we adapt to high spatial frequencies, now they are no longer participating. So, and if the central performance drop is due to them, the central performance drop should disappear and the peak of performance should be closer to the fovea. And that's exactly what we showed. So that was just a sanity check to know that the adapt adaptation manipulation that we were doing was effective. The important part for us was to see how the effect of attention was coming about. So we had three hypotheses. I have hypothesis one is that attention increases the sensitivity of either the small or the large filters. The small filters are in charge of high spatial frequency. 
and the small filters are in charge in the low spatial frequency. So if we adapt to the low spatial frequency and they are responsible for the effects, we should no longer see this benefit. Hypothesis two is that attention increases or decreases the sensitivity of the high spatial frequency filters. So now if we adapt to these high spatial frequency filters, we should no longer see the benefit. And the third hypothesis is that maybe the effect we found has nothing to do with resolution. It just has to do with some signal to noise ratio enhancement. And in that case, regardless of what we adapt to, we should observe the same response. So the baseline is not going to be very informative. <laughs> this is funny. In my display, this just makes it transparent. In your display, it disappears it. So the baseline is not going to be informative. And the third hypothesis is not very informative about resolution either. So now we have the four conditions that are um, critical for us. And it's whether we lose the benefit at the low spatial frequencies or we lose the benefit at the high spatial frequencies. And what we showed is that if we adapt to low spatial frequencies, we have exactly the same effect as in baseline. But when we adapt to high spatial frequencies, we release the central performance drop and we lose the attentional benefit. So if I put the hypothesis together, which I wish you could see, they are transparent there, but we knock out the predictions of hypothesis one and three, and the only hypothesis that is consistent with our results is hypothesis two. That is, that attention exerts its effect by increasing or decreasing sensitivity of the small filters. So what we showed is that endogenous attention shifts the performance peak and modulates the central performance drop, and it's consistent with the population's resolution. So if we adapt to high spatial frequencies, but not to low spatial frequencies, we diminish the central performance drop and we silence the attentional benefit. So with this, we conclude the attention modulates high spatial frequency sensitivity at the central locations. So putting these results together, we see that with exogenous attention, which is on the top, it increases resolution by increasing the contribution of the high spatial frequencies, and that's why this impairment that we have seen disappears after we adapt to high spatial frequencies. Endogenous attention decreases resolution by decreasing the contribution of high spatial frequencies, so the benefit that we had seen at the central locations disappears after we adapt to high spatial frequencies. And if we now fill in this table that I have been building, we know now that the effect of exogenous attention is exerted by increasing the sensitivity of the small filters, those that are responsible for high spatial frequencies, but the effect of endogenous attention comes about by increasing or decreasing the sensitivity of those filters. So just to summarize, exogenous attention automatically increases resolution in search tasks, acuity tasks, but even when it's detrimental for the task as hand, as in texture segmentation. In contrast, endogenous attention increases resolution when it's optimal to do so, but it decreases it when it's optimal to do so. And this shows, and, and, and I have shown you through adaptation studies that both exogenous and endogenous attention modulate sensitivity of the high spatial frequencies selectively at a given eccentricity. I'm going to skip this and just conclude that covert attention alters basic dimensions of visual processing. So contrast sensitivity and spatial resolution are two of the most basic dimensions that we have, are illustrated by the window of visibility that I showed to you. So we know now that it's not very um, useful to think about visual effects that are pre-attentive versus post-attentive. I also have shown you that exogenous attention is automatic, so it trades off both contrast sensitivity and spatial resolution at the attended and the unattended locations. This is completely involuntary even when you tell observers that there's no benefit in attending. And in contrast, endogenous attention is a flexible mechanism that adjusts to task demands 
it always benefits performance even if it has to lower its resolution of the high frequency filters. So um, I just want to conclude with this and um, remind you there's a very interesting area of research now in my lab and many other labs in which we're trying to understand now what are the mechanisms by which covert attention interact with overt attention or eye movements and um, also, I told you at the beginning that we attend to the world selectively, not only in terms of space, even though that's what I, we understand better, but we also attend selectively in terms of features and particular points in time. So now we're conducting some studies in which we're trying to understand how these different mechanisms interact. And just before I finish, I want to show this that a lot of people in the lab, those that are highlighted in yellow, contributed to the studies that I um, did today. Many of them are postdocs and faculty members now. And this is the current lab. Thank you very much. So it's not necessarily rewarding, again, because in the exogenous attention mechanism, I was showing that there's cases where we can completely impair performance, right? So what we know about adaptation is that it's very selective, both in terms of spatial frequency and orientation. We also know that it has more pronounced effects at fovea that are periphery. But it's really interesting. Um, there's a book by Frisbee where he called them the electrodes of the psychophysicist. And it really allows you to see underlying mechanisms. There's no neuroimaging study that I can think of where we could have got to the particular mechanism that is mediated by high spatial frequencies, for example. So this, this probing um, is very important. It does not necessarily have to do with reward. And actually, people, we run psychophysics experts, and we run a lot of naive observers, and everybody has exactly the same effects. And to be honest, most people find these psychophysical studies quite boring. So I don't think there's that much reward. Um, but you can really prove the mechanism in interesting ways. And this adaptation has been shown in V1. It has been shown in extra striate areas. And it has even been shown in anesthetized cats. And it's supposed to be a feed-forward mechanism where you affect the working of V1, and then that cascades. Yes, so, so they're not very small, actually. Um, the point of five was what we showed. But these, these are effects, in contrast, that literally taking you from not seeing something to seeing, or from being unable to discriminate to discriminating. So if I take you on the psychometric function, there could be an improvement of a deep prime of 0.7 or so. So it's not small effects. Um, so that, that's, that's the. That's the first thing. Then you were saying from a sociological viewpoint. Can you explain a little bit more sure. that? The, the, the Bayesians, and there's a revolution yeah. going on. Yeah. I'm not sure, sure. It's, it's a field that, that all of us understand it, but and there's clearly a shift toward a Bayesian perspective in certain tests and one, one data, especially with comparing models. I'm wondering. Sure. Well, it's interesting because if you think about your prior, if you think that the cues are providing information, right? Um, and if that was always affecting in Bayesian ways the same way, we should expect the same effects of endogenous and exogenous attention. And we don't find those. So somehow, it seems that we're not updating our beliefs and our priors. We give feedback, by the way, in the case of exogenous attention. And that's one of the reasons why we have found that it's such a, an automatic process. Right? You can tell the observer, look, you're getting worse here. We can show them their figures. And I actually have studies with a methodology that is called speed accuracy trade-off, where you tell the observer where to respond. And what we find is that in endogenous attention, when the cues, uh, as we change the cue validity, the D prime improves at the attended location or is decremental at the unattended location proportionally to cue validity. And we see the same in the slope of the function. So we see this in terms of information accrual. Um, George Sperling and Ron Kinsla, my former advisor, had data in which they showed that Q validity was proportional, or, or that discriminality was proportional to Q validity. What we brought was to see that the information accrual is two. But the most interesting thing is that with exogenous attention, it does not matter whatsoever 
if I tell you that the queue has a 20% validity, 40% validity, 60% validity, or 80% validity. The effects are exactly the same. So there, and you have feedback, right? So there it seems that we're not updating anything. And these are studies which have 25,000 trials per observer. Um, so we do them at, you know, two, through, through two or three weeks and we see no difference whatsoever in the performance of the first sessions versus the last sessions. So that's an interesting point to think in terms of Bayesian. But I live with a lot of Bayesian at NYU, as you may imagine. So we have, um, and I think it's a very interesting framework to try to interpret some of these results, but not all of them. So uh, it's not only a global effect, because if it was just a global effect, there would be no selectivity, right? So what is the signature of attention is that it's selective processing of information. It's different than alertness, right? If just the brain was just having an increased reticular activating you know, response, everything would be up. That's not the case. Yeah, that's not what I meant. Uh -huh. Uh, let me just show you one. I hope I have this here. Um, here. So, um, in this, um, so this is a, we, we have a, a neuroimaging study where we show actually that. Um, not only you're enhancing, we cannot explain the magnitude of the effect just by enhanced contrast or by reducing the external noise. But actually, it seems that we're pulling the response and affecting also a decision process. So this is just a um, cartoon that was published by Hara, Pestili, and Garner. Pestili was my former postdoc. Garner was Higgers' former postdoc. And they did this follow-up study to one study we had in which they found that um, to explain the simulated neural responses, you can actually have some responses. I cannot see anything here, but here you have some response gain in some neurons. Here you have some contrast gain in other neurons. And what they found is that where in single unit recording, you can find these different responses when you're doing um, at the population average, what happens is that the responses to attended stimuli are pulling across these populations, and then they seem to be dominated by a baseline shift. And we found evidence for this with neuroimaging studies and also to explain the effects of appearance. If, if you want, I can tell you more about it, but we have a model in which we explain the effects of appearance based on this baseline shift. So, it is very likely that attention is affecting different neurons in different way. Actually, we know that from single unit recording, but of course now we're trying to think more at the population level because that's what is going to determine the behavior. Um, the other thing that is important is that some of these neurons, so I've concentrated on studying the effect on early visual areas because I care about how attention alters perception. And I wanted to see how early in the visual processes you can get. And so far, we have not found a task in which we don't find effects. Uh, but of course, there's another very interesting question with attention, which is the control question, which is more you know, frontoparietal areas, right? And there, people have shown differentiated response and not all of neurons. So for example, in frontal eye fields, which are also very important for eye movements, for example, or in LIP, where are very important for eye movements too, what people have found is that there's different population, sub subpopulations. Some of the neurons, for example, in frontal eye field, responds when you're planning an eye movement, but not when you're covertly attending. By you, I mean the monkeys in the study, sorry. Some of the subpopulation respond when you're covertly attending, but not when you're planning the eye movement, and about a third respond in both cases. So I think now we're having a better understanding that some of the neural networks of the control of attention overlap with the networks for eye movements, but that the subpopulation that actually specialize on this covert attention, which can be dissociated from the neurons that are activated when you're planning eye movements.
probably 